is more interesting than even still sleeping. So the next uh, the presentation is by Avinash. Uh, he's a uh, senior DB consultant at Open and he has a uh, uh, 10 plus year of experience uh, <clears throat> in various DB technology, uh, including Oracle, PZ, MySQL, and uh, MongoDB. So his talk is regarding the uh, Postgre uh, upgrade. So as all of you uh, know that Postgre has gone a long way, and by each release, uh, we have been adding a lot of features and also uh, optimization in performance. So it's very important to move from the older version to the newer version to utilize all the new things added into that. So Avinash will be uh, talking about that, that how you can uh, upgrade from PostgreSQL uh, 8.2.13 to 9.5.5. So throughout that, if some tools is used and other details, we'll be sharing with you. So over to Avinas, please uh, join me in welcoming him to give this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, again, um, as I said, I'm Avinas for Larapu, and um, I've started my career with uh, Oracle Database. And um, uh, right after that, like I've even uh, got a chance to work on MySQL or, uh, or MariaDB right now, and even um, a little of Mongo. So then I came to Postgres. And um, yeah, I got uh, quite, an, uh, quite a good opportunity to work on uh, much of the migration stuff, upgrades, et cetera. And um, recently, we have done uh, an amazing migration, I would say, rather, uh, or an upgrade um, of a really complex architecture. And uh, um, it, it sounds pretty simple when you just see migration upgrade with a seamless downtime. Most of us would have already done several such um, upgrades and uh, migrations without any downtime. But when it involves a complex architecture that has got um, great business logic attached to it, and um, also a lot of performance bottlenecks involved, uh, keeping a futuristic uh, scope uh, into consideration, right? Um, that's when um, we really need to see um, how um, uh, you know we come across uh, that complexity and uh, how we make it um, you know an example for uh, most of the future migrations, which. Uh, uh, majority of us would be planning, um, you know, to move away from the legacy softwares. So let's proceed with the presentation. I know we have a very limited time, so do stop me and um, try to ask any questions wherever. And um, yeah, so let's look at the little, uh, a shorter agenda for today. Um, yeah, major concerns in an infrastructure, and of course the case study, Postgres upgrade from 8.2.13 to 9.5.5, and the results learnings, and of course, uh, a couple of minutes for your questions, right? So what are the major concerns in an infrastructure, as we discussed, legacy software? We stay on an old op um, operating system and old database software, and we, you know, we would not be able to proceed further because of a lot of complexities involved. We cannot have um, you know, downtime during the software upgrades. And apart from that, as we do not get enough downtime to perform an upgrade on several gigs or terabytes of um, databases data, right? We keep on adding servers um, horizontally, and we try to uh, you know, increase the performance or scale performance by adding more servers so that we can distribute the load to the newly added servers. And um, that's one of the case study uh, or the example that we are going to talk about. And also, of course, one of the major concerns is business logic sitting inside the database. So most of us would have seen several environments where people use database as an application. They code everything inside the database. That's not something that we really need to um, you know, go further with. I mean, yes, there will be several situations where we may have to uh, put a little of the business logic inside the database, but not entire business logic inside the database, right? So yeah, let's look at this case study. So the purpose is upgrade from 8.2.13 to 9.5.5. Yeah, it looks simple. Let's look at the challenges. 72 database servers in replication in, in using Sloney 1.2. So during the 8.x releases, right, Sloney was very much popular um, tool that was used for replication, right? So Sloney was used to replicate from one master to 68 read replicas and of course, three more replicas were built, and the 
business was actually writing to those three replicas. And now, the customer came to us and said, like, we are facing several performance issues, and we need to fix them. And we, we, were, we may receive like 2x or 3x the load uh, in the next peak season. And we have, I mean, that, that's a huge business. We may not be able to share the details of the client, but um, you know, it's a, it's a huge um, um, uh, business involved and a um, lot of tra traffic involved and 150 application servers, four different application modules are the logics like one related to transactional, back office, reporting, and audits, and of course, 1,200 stored procs, and one of the major challenges, downtime. They do not need any downtime. They cannot really face a downtime, right? And it doesn't mean like I can still go and add or keep on adding more and more servers as I cannot tune anymore my database, right? And of course, as you all know, PG upgrade does not work between 8.x and 9.x. I cannot upgrade. And even PG upgrade does involve downtime, right? And even Sloney 1.2 cannot replicate between 8.2 and any of the 9.x versions. Or even if you talk about the latest Sloney 2.2.5, it can only replicate from Postgres 8.4 to the 9.x releases, but not from the 8.2.13, right? Here is how the architecture diagram looks like. So this A1 that you see here, which is on 8.2.13, or all these servers in replication, please do follow me carefully, because if you understand this architecture diagram well, you would be able to understand the further steps, right? So this master is on 8.2.13, and you have a first layer of replicas, nine replicas over here, which are again on 8.2.13, and the replication is happening using Sloney 1.2. And of course, as you all know, um, the tables which I've got, uh, primary key would be, you know, you would be able to replicate only those tables. And uh, to the second slave and the, you know, and the sixth and the eighth slave, there are furthermore cascaded replication, uh, replicas, again using Sloney. And these four cascaded Sloney replicas have got 13 slaves each. As their business is really spread across like over 70 countries, they wanted to basically distribute it like region-wise or one slave for region. So the business logic is sitting inside the database. They cannot tune the business logic anymore. And they just understood like, yes, we need to keep on horizontally adding more and more servers and get more performance. So this is, the, this is how the problem statement is, and this is how the architecture diagram was when they come to us. And of course, it's, it's not something different that we did. Like we did not come out of this architecture diagram but I'll tell you what really happened after this. So before, yeah, sorry? The database was uh, 220 GB. It, it's a, a little tiny, yes. Right, so let's understand why should we upgrade first. I mean, we did discuss this. Older operating system, database software versions, of course, lacks several new features. When I talk about new features, uh, yeah, of course, most of the migrations to Postgres are really happening from Oracle, so, or you know, other proprietary license softwares. And um, we try to look at those features in our Postgres databases as well, right? So, I, I mean, as I'm from the Oracle database background, I mean, I, I should be able to go ahead and uh, pinpoint um, what really happened at a certain point of time in an Oracle database. So that kind of feature is available. And parallel query processing. So there are several such features which um, are well advanced. And of course, um, there are a lot of tools and extensions, and um, also a lot of um, code comment that have happened recently in the 9.x releases, which does get to you know, those um, new features. So every release, or every major release, has got several new re uh, features involved. So we need to get to that, and that's why. Or every major release has got several new re uh, features involved. So we need to get to that, and that's why we need an upgrade for sure. And as we discussed, increase in transactions needs more service now. And no possibility of performance improvements. If you talk about the 9.5.5 or, or the 9.6, all the tools and extensions that we have got right now opens up a world of opportunities to look at a lot of performance data and see how well we can tune the system, right? Recently, we have got a great uh, tool released, right? I mean, it was done by Yon Week from OpenSCG, like uh, it's PL Profiler, which is a little similar to the Oracle Stats Pack or the AWR, where you can really go ahead and see what's really happening. I mean, the entire call stack of a function and see 
where a problem is or what is the area where you know um, a statement needs to be tuned or where is that problem lying like um, which statement is taking more time you can concentrate on that right so such tools and extensions are not available in the older versions at least in the 8.x right and maintaining my database objects is a true hurdle because again i've got no such extensions or tools which work for the older versions, for example, PG Repack, it does not work for it. I mean, you can do an online table reorg, something similar to DBMS redefinition that you have in Oracle, right? So you can go ahead and do a vacuum full online, right? And also, community doesn't support the older versions. Right now, community supports the versions which are 9.2 and higher. Right. So again, before we going further with how we migrated that, let's look at a couple of the, or a few of the pre-upgrade procedure, what you really have to consider before you're upgrading, right? You need to plan your hardware specifications. Of course, we are all aware of how we plan the CPU cores, but a couple of questions uh, uh, we got in the past were related to hyperthreading, right? So is hyperthreading needed? Um, yeah, for, if you, if, you're looking, if you are using it as a database server, which is hitting a lot of active concurrent transactions. Be careful when enabling hyperthreading. Go ahead and perform your performance testings or the load testings. Make it 2x or 3x and see if hyperthreading is really helping you. You may have to disable that. Be careful while enabling your hyperthreading. Application to database connectivity. Yes, when we talk about application to database connectivity, at least as a database guy, we talk about connection pooling. And why connection pooling? Most of us know. Like, um, Postgres is not direct I.O. And every connection that's connecting to the Postgres, I mean, what, what really happens in the back end is Postmaster forks another child process. So it's process. A process gets created. And if that is not a persistent connection, creating a process and ending a process and again recreating another process is really a costly operation. And that's why we rely on the connection poolers. And uh, yes, we must give a high priority to the native application poolers like Hibernate for Java, or Perl gets uh, you several DBIX modules, and SQL Alchemy Python. So you have several native connection poolers, but if you really cannot proceed with the native connection poolers, <coughs> sorry, native connection poolers, um, try to at least use the lightweight PG bouncer, right? It's widely implemented and um, very widely used at least um, any infrastructure or environment you come across, they would have got PG Bouncer, right? Plan your high availability in advance. How are you going to make your system high available? So what are the kind of tools that I can use? You have got two very good tools in the market, PGHA, Rep Manager, right? So when do you use PGHA for high availability? PGHA, you would use it when you've got PG Bouncers installed on, your, on all your application servers, and you've got a streaming replication involved, right? So if you want your slave to come up automatically, become a master, and make it seamless for the application, PGHA would connect to the application servers or the servers where PG bouncers are installed, reload the PG bouncer configurations with the latest or the newer configuration files, which let your application load hit the new master, right? So. PGHA would be helpful for high availability. And apart from that, Rep Manager. Rep Manager is also one of the amazing, uh, really, I mean, uh, high availability uh, tools, right? So what Rep, Rep Manager does for us is like, uh, it does the same thing what I just said, but it has to be a custom script. <coughs> so what you, do, what you really need to do is, you can let Rep Manager monitor your master, and you can add much more witness service to the Rep Manager, and let it monitor the availability of the master, and if master is not available, you can let rep manager promote the slave, and regarding your application connections redirection, you can write a custom logic. So let's say a master goes down. What do you do? You promote your slave, so your rep manager is doing that. Right after promoting the slave, you need to redirect all your application traffic to the new master, so you may have to uh, you know, reload your PG bouncers if PG bouncer is the connection pooler, or you may have to go ahead and change, uh, uh, you know, your connection poolers or the native connection poolers or the application config files. 
See if you can script those manual tasks that you do and pass that to the promote command of rep manager. And that's it. So rep manager would just run those commands, what you do manually during a failover. So these are the couple of tools that are available for high availability. Which one suits you well? You need to take care, I mean, you need to really see that uh, based on your requirement. Performance testing. During this activity, we did face an issue where um, the application team started telling like, uh, when we did the testing in UAT, 9.5.5 was performing very well. But now in production, uh, it, was, it, it is good, but it is, it is not good as, as good as what we saw in UAT. Why does that happen? When we go back to the stages of testing that they've done, they've done individual components testing with a higher load. But your production does not get separate application modules hitting it, right? So you need to test it really by thinking the performance environment as a production. So when you're doing your testing, think about your performance environment as a production environment and hit it with at least two or three x the traffic of your peak traffic. That's when you would understand your capacity, uh, the capacity of the machine, when you really might have to upgrade your machine to, right? So performance testing is something very important. Do not get into conclusion of uh, configuring your parameters as well without uh, better performance testing. Backup strategy. Backup strategy is something, again, we need to plan in advance. Um, like, all these servers were hosted um, in cloud, Rackspace. So um, what we wanted to do is we use Wally, of course, so that we take a backup and push it to the object store, right? So, but again, for, um, we really consider our system to be a real database system if we are able to recover it to a point in time, right? I mean, if you lose our data, then that's no point. So there is a chance that a server crash can happen or there is a chance that the disk can crash or you know anything could happen and we may lose all the data. But you should be able to recover it. So to recover it, the best backup strategy which every one of us would follow is a file system level backup and continuous archiving. How we achieve it, you have several tools like the native PG-based backup or PG-backrest or PG-barman. There are several tools that are available but ensure that you perform your backup, which should enable you to do a point in time recovery, and also do not get into the situation what uh, GitLab faced recently, right? So they were not able to restore the backups, and they were not able to recover it, right? So that really happened because of lack of backup validation. So you need to plan your backup validation as well in advance, right? So your system production is up and running. And now you started taking your backups. But do you have your backup validation in place? So just go out and see if in case you can restore all your backups and do a point in time recovery. If you're able to do a point in time recovery at least once in a month, that proves that you have valid backups, right? So also make sure that you perform at least one logical uh, backup per week. So why logical backup? Because Logical backups would confirm that your database objects are not corrupted, right? So for example, PG dump. If you take a PG dump of a database, we can conclude that, you know, I mean, if your PG dump is successful, yes, at least I'm able to take a perfect object level, I mean, a logical backup, and my database is not corrupt. And if your database is so huge, like a terabyte of database, and if you do not have enough space in your file system, at least push the PG, PG dump to a null device, right? So when you do that, and if your dump is successful based on the return codes, you can at least say that, yes, my database is not corrupt, right? So you should know where, if your database is corrupt well in advance without much lag, right? So plan your backup strategy by keeping point in time recovery and database corruption and you know, even the backup validation into consideration. And uh, PostgreSQL.conf parameters. Most of the parameters in Postgres, yes, um, they can be changed online, except for very few. So make sure that, I mean, they are very important parameters which you may have to change, right, uh, for better performance. Could be shared buffers or work mem, or there are several other parameters. Plan in advance, and at least your shared buffers cannot be changed without a restart, right? So plan well in advance, 
and um, you know put your Postgres config in para in, into place because even if you consider the, consider the shared pre-root libraries, I have several extensions that help me to look at the performance data and tune my system. And if I don't configure my shared pre-root libraries well in advance, for example, I would like to use Rep Manager or PL Profiler, I need to set appropriate parameters for my shared pre-root libraries. And if I do not do that in advance, in the future when I really have to use those extensions, I'll have to restart my system, which is again a downtime, right? So plan all the PostgreSQL.conf, plan all the extensions, softwares that you need in advance for a production system, right? So we would definitely talk about a few of the extensions and softwares that we used, right? Again, as I'm just going into the steps of how we did this migration, I would like to show this architecture diagram a little more. I mean, once more, right? So again, you know this now. You got the master, you got nine slaves, and you got cascaded slaves, so total 72 servers in replication. And do remember, we have three slaves over there which are taking writes. So the data is not consistent. I mean, from master, the data is pushed to one of the C7, C8, C9 slaves, but C7, C8, C9 has got a little more data or a different data than what it has got on the master. So what we achieved finally, the application has a requirement of 1,000 concurrent connections. I'm not sure whether this diagram is really uh, clear for you all, but I'll tell you what it has got. Uh, 1,000 concurrent connections, 100 days of planning, development, and testing, 10 days of activity, 10 minutes of downtime for writes, and one minute of downtime for reads. That is what we achieved. So it was a magic number, of course, yes, 1,000, 10, 10, 110, and one. So let's see how we upgrade in the process. Yes, it's 72 servers involved. We really did not get much time to do this because um, do this activity because uh, um, of the peak season that customer is going to hit. And customer said, just replace the entire setup on 9.5. And as you said, we would go ahead and get rid of a few of the servers based on the performance improvements, and we'll see how well we can reduce our cost. So build everything same as how it is right now on the same set of servers, so we will get you new servers again, and let's decommission the older ones once the entire migration is done. So now, we configured two dedicated machines for master, and of course, we wanted to enable automatic failover as well in the future, right? So we configured a failover slave, and we configured 71 slave uh, machines on cloud, and I'll talk about this big SQL sandbox that we pushed uh, using Ansible, right? So yes, now we need to install Postgres on all the machines. It's not just Postgres. In the future, I should also be able to tune my system. I should also be able to read all the performance data and see how well I can improve my database performance. So for that, I needed several tools and extensions. I need to push that. So we use Big SQL, right? Big SQL Sandbox. We push just the Big SQL Sandbox through Ansible to all the database servers. Right? And um, also, of course, the PostgreSQL.conf parameters, right? So the infrastructure was just ready in 10 minutes of time, the entire infrastructure. It didn't take much time for us. So what did this Big SQL sandbox include? So it includes a variety of packaged uh, or compiled softwares and extensions. And um, yeah, we used the sandbox of Postgres 955. That included PL Profiler, of course, which clearly gives me the details of or the performance uh, details of my stored procedures. PG Badger, PG Stat Statements Extension, PG Bouncer, PG Repack, PG Buffer Cache, PL Debugger. There are a lot more. These are the ones that we actually enable. So there are other tools and extensions that we can actually enable as well. But we push the entire Big SQL sandbox. So now we do not have to think about what, extens what extension to install again or compile, right? I don't have to worry about it. I just Push the Big SQL sandbox. So my servers are ready. All the servers are ready. Now I need to see how I can replicate between the 8.2 and 9.5. If I'm able to do a continuous replication, then yes, I will be able to go ahead and uh, build all the underlying servers, at least using streaming replication, and think about the further architecture. So this is what we have done. 
So it, it, is, it doesn't really sound um, uh, so great because we used a couple of the ex existing tools only. Does streaming replication work between 8.2 and 9.5? No, it doesn't. What about Sloney as we discussed? It doesn't work between 8.2 and 9.5. Does Londiste work? No. What about Bucado? Yes. So during our testing, we could see that Bucado 5.4.1 release is the only one that enables us to set up replication between an 8.2 and a 9.5. So this is how it looked. So what we did was, we did not want to disturb the existing production system, or the master, I mean to say. So to one of the slaves, this B9, which was the first layer slave, we build one more replica using Sloney. So this is not taking any load. And to this, we built a 9.5.5 Postgres master using Bucado. So this will become my future master, right? So to one of the existing slaves of, you know, which is a Sloney slave, we added one more cascaded Sloney slave, and from there we built a slave, or, you know, this is a source for Bucado, and this is the target for Bucado, right? And we verified the replication and we verified the entire activity and performance, everything. It was working really good. So yes, now we are able to replicate data from 8.2 to 9.5. That's done. Yes. Right. Correct. Yes. We did do testing, and apart from that, when uh, starting from uh, you know starting from the question you asked, um, Sloney, Sloney 1.2 works until 8.3, and after 8.3, it's only Sloney 2 that works. So we cannot really set up replication between 8.2 and 9.5 using Sloney 1.2 or at least Sloney 2.x, right? So Sloney does not work here between 8.2 and 9.5, and Bucado did work, and we performed a great level of testing. Yes because we wanted to make it temporary. We wanted to set up a replication and have all the data replicated continuously. Exactly, so that's the, even that, that's the same for Sloney as well, right? So that is the main reason why you are able to set up replication. Right, so you have a, several layers of replicas which were replicated through Sloney because they were triggers, right? So it's the same again. So same level of, same number of tables for getting replicated, yes. So that's one advantage, right? I mean, all the tables have got primary keys, at least. So now, step number three. Streaming replication between the new master that we built here and all the slaves and cascaded slaves. So now, it's much more easier for me right now. Like, I can get to the same architecture diagram and from here, now I've got 9.5.5 built. This box is ready. So if I really build a streaming replication, there will not be any trigger overhead. And also on top of it, it streaming replication is much faster. Sloney always had a, a lag of eight seconds to 10 seconds based on the, um, uh, you know, um, our testings that we have done in that environment, right? And um, streaming replication was 0.5 seconds the maximum delay, right? So we built all these cascaded replicas using streaming replication, not these three repli um, writable slaves yet. Right? So what did we do? Because we also need to see if in case we can uh, set up an automatic uh, failover in the future, right? So we use Rep Manager here because we wanted to push a custom script after promoting the slave in terms of, uh, you know, in the case of failover. So let's say a failover happens, a slave becomes a master. We also have to make the application connections redirect to the new master, right? So in order to do that, it was just not the PG bouncer that was used. There were also, like, you know, several other connection poolers. And um, we wanted to basically use Rep Manager and uh, see if in case uh, we can push a custom logic during a failover. 
and we set up streaming replication. And now, all the cascaded slaves and the slaves are built. So from a Sloney replication cluster, we got to a 9.5 using Bucardo, and we also let, set up a number of slaves and cascaded slaves. So now we wanted to migrate the reads to the new 9.5s, right? So that we can decommission the old 8.2, just the reads. So what did we do? It was pretty simple again for us. HA proxy was in place, and we just added the new slave server IPs, and we reloaded the HA proxy with new server IPs, and all the read traffic that was hitting the 8.2 Sloney slaves started hitting the 9.5 streaming replicas, basically, right? Just right after hitting the streaming replicas, they started facing very, very good um, you know, performance results. Like, it, uh, like they, they really got uh, like 2x times the performance when compared to the 8.x uh, without much of the changes to the core. And next, we even talked about the three writable slaves. So how did we build that? So what did we do is, for those three writable slaves, we initially created them as replicas using streaming replication again. Okay, so what did we do is, even those three replicas, we added as streaming replicas. And then, we got a downtime window of a couple of minutes for the writes on the 8.2. And we stopped Bucardo replication, right? And then we have gone ahead and added these three writable slaves as well as new targets to the Bucardo replication. It's, it's, uh, it seems confusing for a few maybe, but the next diagram that I'm going to show you should make it a little easier for us, right? And then we started Bucardo replication. So what I was trying to say is, here is my Sloney slave with, uh, to which we created a new Sloney slave. From there, using Bucardo, we built a 9.5.5 master, right? I mean, it will be a future master. And here we got several streaming replicas already built and accepting reads. So now we created three more streaming replicas. These will be our future write, uh, writable slaves, right, which takes writes as well. We stopped this Bucardo, and then we have gone ahead and added these three slaves as targets to this source. So for Bucardo, this was a source, and this was one target. Instead, it's one source and four targets. And Bucardo was still able to do that. OK, so we have got four targets instead of one target. So the customer started writing to these databases. And during that downtime, we were able to go ahead, the application team's logic itself, I mean, it, it has gone ahead and dumped all the data, which was not existing in, this, in these databases, but the other writable slaves, right? They dumped all that data to these three instances, and we just started Bucardo, it just started replicating. So, the only downtime in was involved was, I'm sorry, I told it for writes. It, it's actually for reads, which was a couple of minutes. And the business was OK for a 10 minutes of lag for reads, right? So that really did not um, got us into any kind of uh, 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 you know, issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let let me answer that. So. As I said, um, any product or any solution, it's not just that we go ahead and implement it if it's really working in the first place. 
there will definitely be a lot of test cases involved. And um, yes, we also have uh, several people who do look into the source code of every tool that we go into, you know, implement in the customer locations. And uh, we've got a team who really validates something before implementation. And it's not a solution that's going to be continuously there or, you know, proceed. To, I mean, we are not going to keep Bucardo over there, and we're not going to let Bucardo continue forever, right? So you'll see the further architecture, right? Uh -huh. Exactly, yes. Exactly. That's correct. Okay. Right. That's exactly correct. So it's not um, like, you know, Bucardo, it's not just that case. There are several stages where Bucardo can fail and, um, you know, I mean, if Bucardo fails at one small stage, it still gets stopped. And uh, you know, it will not continue. But again, based on those conditions only, during which was happening you know, during our testings, we have scheduled it at the end phase, the lowest or the last phase. And apart from that, it is like a 10 minute of downtime that can be possible. I mean, a 10 minutes of delay was acceptable by business for all the reads. Because if you could consider, this was actually taking audits, which was able to accept a little delay as well. And apart from that, even the reads can accept a delay of 10 minutes. So if anything breaks with Bucardo, right, we have got all our monitorings in place, which would notify us as well, and we would action it, yes. But that's not the situation that we faced as well. We have got a lot of uh, monitorings, and as well as, um, you know, there was a team who was continuously looking at what's happening, right? So and it happened at the end phase where we did not give days of time for the entire thing to complete, right? So right after this, right after we setting this up, we redirected the rights to the new 9.5 and we broke this and we are going to implement slowly, right? So that's, it's just like we need to come out of this. There is no option where we can get out of 8.2 and get to 9.5 without using any solution. I understand, Bucardo is not supported. Bucardo does not, I mean, Bucardo is not supported, no further development, but do I have any other option right now, right? So yes, I can try to come up with our own or my own custom product, but again, we, our testings and everything what we have uh, gone ahead with, it proved Bucardo to be working for the existing situation, right? So that's why we had to proceed with it. And yes, keeping all those situations into consideration, right? We had all our monitorings in place, and we had well-planned when to do what. Exactly, yes. So Bucardo breaks, and we do not want Bucardo to break, and break the entire system, and we planned it. Yes. So, and yes, and right after that, we redirected all the rights through BG Bouncer to the existing 8.2.13. So there were several other connection poolers in place, right? So we replaced all those uh, connection poolers and the direct writes that were happening from the application to the master without a pooler, and we have got PG Bouncer implemented um, as a connection pooler, and we got all the writes getting redirected through PG Bouncer to the writable uh, 8.2.13 master. So we have configured PG Bouncer on a new server, redirected all the application writes to the 8.2.13, and we validated all the uh, business logic and everything is working good or not because in the future just a PG bouncer restart should redirect all the rights to the 9.5.5 master and should just get us out of this migration, right? So that's something that was done. So we implemented PG bouncer and we restarted PG bouncer with a new configuration file which connects the um, you know, application rights to the new master. And then we stop Bucardo replication, and we set up Bucardo replication between the new master and the three writable slaves temporarily, and we have got the restart of PG bouncer done with the new master IP address for writes, and that's when we concluded our migration. And then 
we have gone ahead and uh, you know proposed the Sloney, but you know that's something that's being planned right now. Now the business is like, yes, we are happy with Bocado. Business understands the complications with Bocado, and uh, the I mean the client also understands the complication with Bocado. A stop off, or if one writable slave is not available, the entire Bocado replication breaks. They were okay with that. I mean, yes, it's just for audits. If something breaks, we can go ahead and start it. But our writes and all the streaming replicas are working well. So there is a plan to in phase where everything is getting redirected to, I mean, every, all, the write, all the writable slaves are getting built through Sloney. We are going to look at that as well, yes. So just to show you a diagram of, uh, you know, of this elephant, like, uh -huh. no. No, it did not, yes, right. I mean, we would have definitely not uh, finished the migration if we would have got, yes, that's correct. So yes, we have used all these tools and extensions to proceed with this and uh, finish this migration. So one was Big SQL, Sloney, which is now being implemented, PL Profiler, Bocado, PG Buffer Cache, HA Proxy, Rep Manager, PG Bouncer, so there were a lot of extensions and tools, even PL debugger, that really helps us to debug. And uh, so all these tools and extensions were used, right? And the ultimate results, when, the, um, we, when um, they were on the older architecture diagram, right? Like with 8.2.13 being replicated um, you know, to the 8.13 slaves using uh, Sloney, you need to manually push all your DDL changes and the code changes. Now we do not need to push all uh, the code changes manually, right? And yes, there is a lot of improvement in reads and writes performance, and the replication lag reduced to 0 0.5 seconds due to streaming replication, and also the stored prox performance. Now we are able to look at the performance of all the functions using PL Profiler. So we run PL Profiler, or we enable PL Profiler from one duration to another duration, right? One time to another time, and they can read what all really happened during that time. It's something similar to our AWR report in Oracle, right? Or stats pack, right? So you can see what really happened at what stage, and uh, what is the SQL that's taking more time, or where in the call stack really uh, did a problem happen or a time lag happen, right? So that really helped the application team to go ahead and tune those SQLs and uh, improve the uh, performance. And now, the servers are actually able to handle over three times the load. So the newer version software enables, used to, enables us to scale the performance with the hard drive, uh, hardware, right? So with the older versions, you have a very big hardware, but still, your performance or the application or the database performance may not be able to scale up, right? So the newer versions enables you to scale up with the hardware, right? So that needs to be considered. And yes, now there is a plan to reduce all the servers. And yes, a few servers have already been reduced. And now the performance data has enabled us to calculate what kind of configuration server can replace how many servers. So now all that level of 72 servers that we are looking at right now, after going to 9.5.5, will be around 10 to 12 servers in uh, the next uh, phase. And um, yes, there we are also going to implement Sloney. So, and uh, yes, and also apart from that, there is also a plan to decommission the three writable slaves, and that's, that's one more plan in place. Because the writes, when they were writing to the older 8.2.13 master, right, there was not a good performance because of the trigger overhead. And now the um, application team is confident enough even to redirect all the writable slaves load to the master. So that's even one more plan in place. So now you just got master and streaming replicas in place, and there is no other complexity involved. Automatic failover. Once we get rid of these three writable slaves, we will enable the automatic failure failover. Right now it's manual, and we have a process of how to enable failover. When we were on the version, there was no chance of a failover as well. That's the kind of the system that the team was on at that time, right? Now, we have given them an option of failover, which is manual, 
and an automatic failover as well. Partitioning. Yes, now we got very good extensions and tools, right? So we got PG Pathman and uh, PG Partman that helps you to um, you know, manage your partitions as well. And that's something that's again being planned right now, right, in the next stage where we are going to partition a few tables and, um, and we are also going to um, start enabling the archiving features, right? And learnings, as discussed, it's not just the uh, support or the way Bucado breaks. Bucado lag also is very huge. It's 40 seconds to 120 seconds on an average when compared to a Sloney lag of eight seconds to 20 seconds. But again, after this migration, we may not really have to talk about these two as well. Unless the business is really considered that they want to really separate out these audits and say, we still want to have these three writable slaves. Yes, they're going to use or implement Sloney. But there is still a plan to get rid of all these. And a couple of parameters that I really want to talk about when we have such uh, slaves or cascaded set of slaves or higher number of cascaded slaves, right? Max standby archive delay and also max standby streaming delay. So what is this? Um, we know that uh, if we redirect reads to a slave and if the table on which a select query is running on a slave, if on the same table a vacuum is being performed on the master, if auto vacuum kicks in and starts removing the older versions, and if the query on the slave is dependent on those older versions, it just gets killed, right? So to avoid that, we enable a few parameters and say like hot standby feedback on, right? So similarly, when we do that, we also need to be careful setting these max standby archive delay and streaming delay to ensure that the long running transactions on the slaves do not lag your replication until you know, uh, the DDL changes on the master. I mean, let's say you apply DDL changes on the master and you want that to be replicated to the slave. And if you set your max standby streaming delay as forever, like minus one, until your long running transactions on the slave completes, your replication will halt. So be careful with these. And uh, these are a couple of learnings that we wanted to share. Yep, so that's everything uh, from our side. Uh, I think we are done with the time as well. Any questions? Uh, we'll take a few questions.